So welcome to our second talk of the fall quarter of the David Rumsey Map Center at Stanford uh, Libraries. Uh, my name is Salim Mohammed. I am the head and curator of the center. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping um, to, to start with. Uh, I will introduce the speaker. Arman will speak for about 45 minutes. Um, please add your questions to the question box as you get, uh, as you think of them. Uh, just, just remember to be specific uh, in your question because Arman will answer them uh, at the end. Um, I expect uh, we'll do about 15 to 20 minutes of uh, questions uh, and, and then we'll close, okay? Um, so this talk is a special event. Um, it celebrates uh, exemplary work by a student studying towards a degree in California and has used the map collections from the Ramsey Map Center and maps or, uh, housed uh, elsewhere at Stanford Libraries, uh, particularly the Brand Earth Sciences Library and, and map collections. Um, just a little bit about the competition that brought about uh, today's speaker. Um, the California Map Society, in partnership with the, with the Ramsey Map Center, sponsors a student as a competition each year. Um, and um, I, I really want to take this opportunity to thank the California Map Society, uh, particularly their officers and directors, the membership that helps make it happen uh, for the continued uh, partnership and support for this uh, annual essay competition. Uh, John Jablonski, who's here, um, was the president during the 2019, uh, 2020 uh, year. Um, so this competition was administered uh, during his tenure last year and uh, now is uh, immediate past president. Uh, thanks also to the current president, uh, uh, Ron Gibbs. Uh, my thanks also go to judges of the competition, uh, David Rumsey himself, um, Grant Parker, who's a professor of classics here at Stanford, and Judith Tyner, uh, uh, she's a professor emerita of geography at uh, California State University at Long Beach. Um, they've been doing this for four years now, and I'm very appreciative of, uh, of their help um, uh, each year. So again, uh, thank you so much for, for your help. I just wanna make sure they get this uh, public acknowledgement um, because it can be a lot of work. Um, the essay winner receives a cash prize of $1,000 and an opportunity to present uh, his essay. And the winner of the 2019-2020 uh, competition is Arman Kassam. Um, on, on behalf of the California Map Society and the Ramsey Map Center, I want to congratulate you on this achievement. Uh, we hope uh, that this is going to be one of many articles and scholarly works that you'll author and contribute to the world of cartography. Um, this, is, uh, this is a bright beginning, I hope, and so we're looking forward to that. Uh, a little bit about Arman. Um, Arman is a junior here at uh, Stanford University, and he is from Durham, North Carolina. Um, he is studying history uh, and anthropology. Uh, one of his major interests is the history of oppression and the way that nations and states have institutionalized oppressive symbolic systems. Arman loves maps and mapping, edits for the undergraduate history journal Herodotus uh, and is the captain, uh, is a captain of Basmati Ras, a traditional Indian dance team on campus. Um, in his talk uh, today entitled Mapamundi as Self-Portrait, Difference and Dissidence in the Worlds of Guaman, Homo and Urbano Monte, Arman Kassam will speak on the fascinating intersections between the two different amateur cartographers on separate ends of the 16th of the early 16th century Spanish empire. In the course of writing this essay, Armand has uh, looked extensively at the Urbano Monte map, which was a major acquisition in 2017 by David Ramsey and is part of our collections here at the David Ramsey Map Center. Armand expands on the stories of Urbano Monte um, the Milanese uh, nobleman um, engaged in a personal project concerning universal knowledge and Guaman Oma, a Quichua nobleman who subversively asserted his right to territory in the Nueva Coronica uh, 
in, uh, and these intertwine in unexpected ways. Uh, both come from uh, noble lineages, uh, lived in territories recently uh, brought under Hasbro control and cared deeply about humanist erudition. Importantly, both also found in the world map a useful medium for their projects of political power and erudition. Rather than merely showing the differences of their interests, these amateur world maps reflect back on their authors as self-portraits, testaments to individuals finding themselves in an ever globalizing world. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Arman Kassam and his talk, Mapa Mundi as Self-Portrait, Difference and Dissidence in the Worlds of Goma and Poma and Urbana Monte. Take it away, Arman. Wow, thank you so much, Salim. Um, before I begin my presentation, I just want to say a few things. Um, the first is, it's so nice to see familiar and new faces today. I see friends, I see teachers, I see peers, and I see plenty of people that I don't already know. It kind of seems like we already have a global composition. We have people from Austin and Colorado and California, of course. Uh, I myself am from Durham, North Carolina. We have lots of trees here. It's lovely, trust me. Um, I did decide to come dressed with a tie and a dress shirt, but I assure you, I'm not really that formal. I can also assure you that I'm currently wearing pajama bottoms. So maybe that can tell you something about me um, or at least about the Zoom era. When I asked my, when I asked my advisor, uh, Professor Karn Wiggin, what to do for this presentation, she gave me two pieces of advice. The first piece of advice was don't spend too long thanking people because that can get really boring. And to be completely honest with you, I agree with that. But I hope that she'll make an exception for me to thank her and Professor Martin Lewis for giving me the opportunity to write this essay. Without their guidance, I wouldn't be anywhere. I wouldn't have an essay. I'd also like to thank the California Map Society for their generosity and also for the David Ramsey Map Center for theirs. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity and I'm honestly blown away. Thank you. The second piece of advice she gave me was don't read from a script because that can also be really boring. And unlike the former piece of advice, I'm gonna follow this one hopefully to a T. It is my hope that this is an organic, natural sort of presentation and not just me reading my essay and recounting what I thought like a year ago. I hope it's a little bit more organic and lively and engaging. And at least I hope that you maybe take something interesting from this, um, but thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate that. Um, one last thing, I will blaze through these slides, not fairly quickly, but moderately quickly. So I'm going to link my slides to you all. I just dropped them in the chat. So feel free to view them at your own leisure and at your own pace. And I've also linked all of the maps that I use for this presentation to the respective David Rumsey website, and as well as the Danish library where I get Guam and Poma's images. So feel free to go through those at your own leisure. I don't feel like you have to follow me to a T. Okay, I'm gonna begin to share my screen. Alrighty. Let me minimize this. Uh, sorry, Salim, can you see? Um... Yes. Okay, perfect. It's looking good. Let's get ready then. Yeah, looking good. Okay. Let's get started. Uh, okay, there we go. So today, my presentation will be about two noblemen both subjects of the Spanish empire at the end of the 16th century and the beginning of the 17th century, both engrossed in these personal passion projects that interestingly never really got to see the light of day. Us, the modern viewer, are actually some of the first privileged viewers and audience members to these passion projects. And in these projects, these two noblemen included world maps in Latin known as map mundis. What I found to be really interesting about their stories was that they projected themselves within these maps. They used these maps as examples of self-portraiture. The obvious difference between them though that kind of puzzled me was that one of them lived all the way in colonial Peru and the other one lived all the way in Milan, the Lombard city. Peru had been devastated by the expansion of the Spanish in 1535 when Francisco Pizarro, the conquistador took over the territory. Milan in an interestingly concurrent manner, got taken over by the Habsburgs in 1536. Both these individuals became a part of a collective political entity 
and never knew each other, never had a reason to know each other, didn't know each other really existed, but had such interestingly parallel lives. And that's precisely what I want to dissect in today's talk. How did these two cartographers end up making such similar maps? But before I talk about the maps themselves and the really interesting nuances of self-portraiture, I wanna talk about the men behind the maps. And so first we're gonna talk about the Peruvian, Felipe Guamanpoma de Ayala. Now, before I go any further, let me just express my thanks to one scholar in particular. Her name is Relena Adorno. In 1986, she wrote Guaman Poma, Writing and Resistance in Colonial Peru. And without her fantastic monograph on the life of Guaman Poma, his subversive political stances, all of the intricacies of his illustrations, I wouldn't be here today. So she is the primary secondary source. That's a bit confusing. She is the main secondary source that I'm drawing from for today's presentation. So let's talk a bit about Guaman Poma. Born around 1550, died after about 1616. There's some important details you need to know about him. First, he was a native indigenous man and a chronicler as well. There had been many European chroniclers and historians that had dictated the history of colonial Peru, but only from the vantage point of the Spanish empire. Guaman Poma, on the other hand, a descendant of Incan royalty, situated the indigenous perspective in his chronicle, made sure that the plight of, the, of indigenous people um, devastated by the encroaching power of the Spanish empire was told, was given voice. Something else that's really interesting about Guaman Poma is that even though he's a member of Incan royalty, he's only directly descended on his mother's side. And Incan royalty by blood is usually passed down on the patrilineal side. So he makes some interesting tenuous claims to royal blood and an Incan tradition, and that'll come into play a little bit later on in his presentation. The next thing you need to know about him is that he spent most of his life in the central Peruvian city of Huamanga, the ancestral lands where his family grew up and laid claim to territory. And he worked as a scribe for the Viceroyalty of Colonial Peru. He assisted the likes of Mercedarian Friar Martin de Marua, and it's speculated that because of his connections to the administrative authorities of the Viceroyalty, as well as his connections to different missions, Guaman Poma had access to catechisms, to Bibles, to diverse maps even, that probably informed his fantastic project that we'll get into a bit later. The last thing that you need to know about him is that in a cruel twist of fate, he was expelled from administrative work and stripped of his privileges after claiming boldly that he had noble lineage and a right to local land. The Spanish administration at this point had divorced him of all of his claims to land, of all of his noble lineage, of his possessions, of his status. He has a very complex political outlook, and this is best summarized by Relena Adorno in her monograph when she writes that Guaman Poma was in favor of native rule and opposed to colonialism. He was anti-Inca, but pro-Andean, anti-clerical, but pro-Catholic. And when I first approached the subject material, I was really confused about this. And I hope that by the end of this presentation, I'll be able to show how this complex political outlook was actualized by Gorman Poma. Now, the masterpiece that he made, this passion project that never actually saw the light of day was the monstrous El Primer Nueva Coronica y Buen Gobierno the first new chronicle and good government in English. This is a whopping 1,200 handwritten pages, both a letter and a chronicle of Peruvian history. It was designed to be given to King Philip III. And basically it was meant to call to task King Philip III and the, the exigencies of the, or excuse me, the devastation of the Spanish empire that had been wrought upon the indigenous population at this time. Um, not only does it have 1200 pages, it is also chock full of 400 full page illustrations. So here we have examples of Andean religiosity, dualities, as well as the title page, which is all over to the left. And among the illustrations that Guaman Poma made in the 33rd chapter, where he talks about what a good government of colonial Peru would actually look like, not necessarily, not necessarily the vice royalty, Guaman Poma includes a Mapamundi, a world map. It should be noted though, that unfortunately, unlike all of the fantastic images we have of Urbano Monti's map, Guaman Poma's map comes in pretty much only low quality images because the Danish library hasn't standardized the quality of their scans. So unfortunately, I'll be switching in between different versions of this map to get the best quality image we can possibly get. Um, but what I was most interested in when I saw this map was this, all the way over to the left, kind of left of center, um, Guaman Poma depicts his grandfather, his paternal grandfather, as well as his paternal grandmother. His paternal grandfather was actually the 10th king of the Incan Empire, Yapunki. Uh, 
And right above them is a blazon, a coat of arms. And this is a coat of arms that Guaman Poma had made for his own family that he had projected back into his genealogical past. This coat of arms has an eagle and a lion, and it actually matches up with Guaman Poma's own name. Guaman means eagle and Poma means puma or lion in, in Quechua. The second man I'll be talking about today is Urbano Monti. And ironically, despite the fact that he wasn't a colonial subject, we don't actually have nearly as much information about Monti, at least translated into English. Um, Urbano Monti was born around 1544 after Milan had been captured by the forces of Charles V in the Spanish Empire and died around 1613. Some important details about his life. He was born into a patrician family of Milan while the city was under Habsburg control. He's also been characterized as a bit of a recluse. He never took up a significant civic or administrative post. Instead, he confined himself to scholarship for most of his life. It's been well documented that he probably had a fairly substantial place in the European Republic of Letters, but unfortunately, most of the information we have about him has been passed down directly from him. He's also one of the few Renaissance scholars that had the opportunity to meet with a very famous Japanese embassy that came from Japan around 1582 and then arrived in Milan in 1585. Urbano Monti had the chance to interview some of the ambassadors from Japan and even published a treatise on their journey where he documented scrupulously their itinerary from Japan coming all the way to Europe. And in a weirdly similar twist of fate to as Guam and Poma, Urbano Monti towards the end of his life became caught up in fights over inheritance. And this is probably likely due to the fact of having an eldest son who uh, was a bit unethical in his use of funds. But we don't have accurate information on the latter part of Monty's life. The passion project that I'll be talking about today for Monty is none other than Urbano Monty's gigantic planisphere. This is a nine by nine foot map. And as Salim um, said earlier, the David Rumsey Map Center acquired this map in 2017, but they only acquired one of the three maps that currently exist and were made by Monty. The one that they acquired is his first working prototype, a one made in 1587. He also made one in 1590 and another in 1615. Something to note about the 1615 version though is that it has tons of issues. He tried a completely new projection on his map and it, complete, it completely disrupted the aesthetic. Um, some important information about this map, contextual information. It's considered the centerpiece of Monty's program for universal knowledge. He lived at a time when conceptualizations of the world were expanding, when not only was the new world discovered, but also a passage and an entire new ocean, uh, the Pacific Ocean, and a passage to Asia. Um, his map also is loaded with ethnographic descriptions of this emerging world order. It includes busts of monarchs, for example, and descriptions of different cultures from China to India uh, to different kingdoms in Africa. Chet Van Duzer, a very prominent scholar in cartography, notes that um, Urbano Monti probably was afflicted by the disease of horror vacui. And it's a very common disease that apparently all these 16th century cartographers had. And what it means, uh, it's translated as basically fear of empty space. So instead of simply admitting that he didn't know what lied beyond a certain border or what was in a certain continent, Urbano Monti just kind of made up different information and aesthetic designs to fill an empty space, to make it seem like he truly had a universal program of knowledge that was fully developed. This map has also been noted for its really weird perspective. Its projection is a nor North Polar azimuthal one. And what that basically means is that we're kind of looking down onto like the surface or the top of a globe. And what this does is it distorts the area at the very fringes of this map. So the Antarctic islands that kind of surround this map in a halo or a ring are way bigger are disproportionately bigger than they actually should be on a typical map. Now, while the intended audience for Guam and Poma's treatise was King Philip III, this was Guam and Poma calling to task King Philip III for the destruction of Andean culture, Urbano Monti had a very different perspective and intended audience in mind. His intended audience was likely students, students that he would have or would have wanted to have. And what I found really interesting about Monty on this map, very similar to Guam and Poma, is that Monty puts himself on this map. Here, he's included a self-portrait of himself at the very borders of it. And you might be asking, Armand, what is that giant flap above the self-portrait? And the answer is, Urbano Monti made this map in 1587 and depicted himself at age 43. And then two years later, he thought he didn't look good enough. So he redid his self-portrait at age 45 and pasted it over. So we actually have this kind of archaeology, this kind of stratigraphy of different selves, which I think is interesting. Um, he didn't just put his self-portrait, though. 
uh, in that map. He also put his self-portrait in other maps as well. And this is where I'd kind of like to suggest that perhaps Urbano Monti and Guaman Poma were a bit egotistical, a bit not so humble for their time. Here, Urbano Monti has depicted himself at center. On the left is the explorer Alvisa Catamosto, quite famous in Italian circles. And to the right is none other than Homer. So yes, Urbano Monte definitely thought highly of himself. And he didn't just put his self-portrait on the map, uh, on his planisphere map though, he also put a coat of arms, just like Guam and Poma. Now, the reason why I say that it's unusual for these cartographers to impose themselves on their maps so prominently, to position themselves at such a high point in their maps, is because on typical early modern maps from this time, the blazons, the emblems, the coats of arms that we see, they aren't meant to depict that of the cartographer. They're meant to depict that of a patron. But the thing is that Urbano Monti and Guaman Poma didn't have patrons. They just intended their pieces for particular audiences, but otherwise they funded their pieces themselves, most likely. This is a map from 1715 made by the English cartographer, Joseph Moxon. It's paradise for the Garden of Eden. And I spent a whole summer stressing about it. I think it actually shows a very stereotypical example of what an early modern map usually looks like. Even though Joseph Moxon made this map, and even though he was incredibly prestigious in cartographic circles at this time, he was actually one of the first tradesmen to enter the Royal Society. The emblem that we see at top left isn't his own, it's George, Duke of Buckingham, his patrons. So this emblem of the horse and the reindeer belongs to the patron, it does not belong to the cartographer. That being said, even though I've claimed that Guaman Poma and Urbano Monti are a bit, uh, a bit not so careful with the way that they demonstrate pride. You know, that being said, there are still plenty of atlases that emphasize authorship. A great example is the first modern atlas ever, um, or at least in Europe. And that is Ortelius's Theatrum Orbis Terrarum, which was first published in 1570. This is one of the first pages. And here, Abraham Ortelius positions himself as the author, but right before he does that, he makes sure that he dedicates his piece to King Philip the second. So even though Abraham Ortelius has positioned himself, he doesn't do it nearly as prominently as I would argue Urbano Monti or Guam and Poma. Here's another really fun example. It's Gerard Mercator and Jodicus Hondius fawning over or kind of fawning over some globes and inspecting them with compasses. And uh, they had very famously, well, Jodicus Hondius had, take the word, had taken the work of Mercator and republished it uh, again in 1607. And in this version of their collected, collective atlas, uh, you might say like, okay, this is a very clearly an egotistical example of authorship and cartography. That might be the case, but I think it's very different than what we see with Guam and Poma and Urbano Monti. And the reason why is because this was made in 1613. That was a year after Jodicus Hondius had died. And so both of these cartogra cartographers were not living. Instead of this being a representation of a cartographer putting himself on a pedestal, this is instead kind of the followers, the advocates, the supporters of those same cartographers cherishing the, the credibility and the ethos and the authorial aura of the people that originally made this atlas. So a very different context. So I'd like to maybe suggest, are these peculiar, peculiar, peculiarly brazen examples of self-portraiture? And I think so. And I think that's exactly what we need to investigate when we compare Guam and Poma and Urbano Monti. The first question I'll be investigating over the course of this talk is, why in the world did they place themselves on their maps? It's an important historical question for basically creating a baseline for the rest of our research. The next question is, how might we compare these examples of self-portraiture? And ultimately, the main question that I'll be trying to tackle over the course of this talk is, how do they portray themselves with a particular audience in mind? And this is what I re would really like to focus on. It's this sort of tension between authentic authorial selves and then those authorial selves being cognizant that they have an audience that they're appealing to, that they can't, they can't just be limitlessly egotistical. So it's this sort of tension between the internal self and external representation that I'd like to focus on as we move forward. Um, before we get into any of the nitty gritty, I do need to roadmap, um, road mapping about maps. Uh, this talk is divided into three different parts. The first part is about two very different maps. And just like in any talk, when I claim that I should compare or that we can draw the similarities between two historical sources, we first need to show why we cannot do that. Um, so I'd like to talk a bit about why these maps are very different. And this will involve some formal characteristics 
that don't necessarily have a bearing on the argument that I'm trying to make over the talk, but are interesting nonetheless and have tons of resolved and open, unresolved and open questions that um, you all might be interested in pursuing on your own. The second part of this talk is dedicated to the displaying of deference. So the different ways that these authors basically situated themselves in a particular discourse and appealed to and acknowledge different fantasies of authority, um, specifically the authority of the Spanish. So in Urbano Monti's case, that would have been King Philip II. For Guam and Poma's case, that would have been his descendant, King Philip III. And for the final part of the talk, I'm in the real meat, I think, of my argument. I want to talk about the different ways that these two cartographers portray themselves, the different ways that maybe they balance their portrayal with the audience that they have in mind. OK, let's get started with two very different maps. So this is Guaman Poma's map of Mundi again. We're going to kind of get into it, but I want to switch over to a different version of the map. And this is one that I've taken from Adorno's text. I think the black and white makes it a lot easier to kind of pinpoint some of the formal characteristics in this map that are interesting. The first characteristic I'd like to draw your attention to is these horizontal and vertical lines that make up a graticule or a coordinate plane. Um, they almost kind of want you to find very specific locations on this map. It, it's almost like Guam and Poma is asking us to investigate this map as an emblem of science, but uh, I think you'd be hard pressed to find an exact location using this coordinate plane. It doesn't necessarily look like it would lead you to an exact location. Um, normally historians of cartography would say that Ptolemaic maps came along and had graticules and that was the advent of the modern map and everything before it kind of got scuttled. Uh, this, for example, is one of the very first uh, maps with the Ptolemaic reticule. It was made by, of course, Claudius Ptolemy, as well as Nicholas Germanus. It was a 1482 edition of the Cosmographia. It's also a map that I had the chance to work on over the summer. And as you can notice, at the very top and the very sides of these maps, um, there are these numbers that are meant to represent longitude and latitude. Historians of cartography might also usually say that before the Ptolemaic Graticule, there were pre-modern maps that didn't have these coordinate planes and didn't involve a precise science of space, space and time. This, for example, is Fra Mauro's very famous uh, medieval map of Mundi made in 1450 on the island of Murano. What's so interesting about Guam and Poma's map is it really doesn't compromise between mixing these two genres of maps bears all of the aesthetics of a typical medieval map of Mundi imported directly from Europe, but simultaneously, it also appeals to the Ptolemaic conception of maps. It appeals to the aesthetic of scientific precision. And I think that's a really fascinating blend. I think if it, if it shows anything, it shows that the transition from map of Mundi to Ptolemaic map was not a flash in the pan. It was gradual. It took several years. The next part of the map that I'd like to talk about are sea monsters that decorate this map and are staples of European medieval map of Mundi. It's actually one of the characteristics that both Guam and Poma and Urbano Monti have. So on this collection of images right here, we can see similarities between the depiction of mermen or mermaids, as well as these whales that are spouting water uh, from above their heads, they might be belugas. I would definitely refer you all to Chet Van Duzer, who's written extensively on monsters and maps. Um, for kind of more information about this. Suffice to say that I think the most interesting monster here, and certainly my favorite, is the one at top right, which is a giant bird carrying an elephant over the Pacific Ocean. I'm pretty sure this is a rock, um, a, a giant bird of, of epic fairy tales. The third characteristic of this map that's interesting is that in a typical European medieval map, uh, Jerusalem would be depicted at center. It was the center of European Christendom. Guam and Poma does something a little bit subversive here. Instead of putting Jerusalem at center, he puts Cusco, the center of Peru. So now the center of Peru has become the absolute center of an emerging world order, of an expanding universe that includes both indigenous characteristics as well as Spanish characteristics. Some details I'm also not really so sure of, and I'd be really interested in hearing other theories about this. So maybe in the Q&A we can talk about this, but for example, I can't, don't really know how to explain the background of this map. For example, the woods or the mountains, um, and one of the details that actually my mom pointed out to me last night when I was doing a run through of this talk was that the sun and the moon are almost kind of projected onto the ocean at the top left and top right of this map. It's almost as though Guam and Poma has forgotten to draw a dividing line between the sky and the sea. He's forgotten to draw the horizon, but it may also be that he's showing the sky reflected on the sea, which I think was a really interesting take. 
The last thing that I'd like to mention here is that there are countless dualities. So like I just mentioned, uh, the sun and the moon count as one of them, but there are many other dualities. For example, we have at left what I mentioned before, Guaman Poma's paternal grandfather and his paternal grandmother, as well as that coat of arms situated just right above them. At the very center of this slide, we see two different coats of arms, two different blazons. The blazon to the left is that of the papacy, the spiritual authority, and that of the right is the Spanish empire, that is the human mortal authority. And finally, the last duality that I like to mention is just that of the sun and the moon that I already talked about. That pretty much sums up some of the most interesting characteristics of this map. Let's move on to Urbano Monti's map. Now, one of the benefits of using a North Polar azimuthal projection is that it makes this really nice center in the map, kind of like a globe's axis. And this center was actually meant to be a pivot so that a viewer could rotate the map. Urbano Monti leaves us with a very long treaty explaining how the map was meant to be assembled. This map wasn't actually, sorry, I'm just gonna head back really quickly because this map wasn't actually like this when Urbano Monte, um, Urbano Monte had not actually created this map that we see right here. Instead, he had drawn 60 individual sheets and they were only recently digitized in 2017 altogether in the way that Urbano Monte had envisioned. He writes in his universal treaty that the map of Mundi can be turned around for whoever wants to see every part of it closely, that it was intended to sit vertically, kind of like a wall, and then five feet up, there would be a knob at the center of that axis, and then you could turn it so that you could inspect some of the finer details closely. Another example that I've kind of mentioned earlier on is that Urbano Monti depicted Japan to such precise detail that he actually deviates from a lot of the other contemporary European cartographers of his era. So this map of Japan that you see here is chock full of cities that lots of other European maps at the time simply didn't have. And that's probably, be probably because he had the chance to interview Japanese ambassadors in 1585. Um, another interesting detail are these Antarctic islands that I mentioned. Uh, they are disproportionately enlarged and we don't actually see many other examples of this in the early modern. He also lists all, all of his classical and modern sources. Guam and Poma also used a flurry of sources to make his Nueva Coronica. But one of the differences between them is that Urbano Monti listed his sources directly on his map. So he draws from Ptolemy, Gestaldi, Mercator, Pliny the Elder, Cortez, Marco Polo. These include ancient sources, classical sources, as well as contemporary cartographers and a handful of explorers and conquistadors, among others. The last detail of this map that I'd like to point out is that he doesn't just show geographic information like I mentioned, he shows very specific ethnographic information and in particular profiles of monarchs. Here we have eight different profiles that are all situated around the fringes of the map. And these profiles include famous world leaders like the Ottoman emperor, the king of Spain, the king of Poland, the king of Portugal, among others. What's really fascinating about these and something that I don't think we're gonna have much time to go into but might be connected to what I say is that instead of explaining particular individuals, instead of specifying particular lives as occupying these positions, Urbano Monti is a bit vague. Instead of saying King Philip II, here he says just the King of Spain and the Indies. Um, the same goes for the Turkish Emperor, the King of Poland, the King of Portugal. Um, it's not the same for Prester John though, and Prester John was actually believed to exist. He was a uh, European cultural artifact uh, from the uh, medieval and early, early modern. It was believed that there was a king in Ethiopia who was Christian that would come to the aid of Europe during the final crusades in the time of revelations. Kind of interesting. Uh, another interesting thing about these monarch profiles is that the King of Spain and the King of Portugal were the same person at this time. It was King Philip II. So it kind of lends itself to this idea that Urbano Monti didn't intend to depict particular lives, but instead intended to depict these timeless regal positions that transcended any one era. And that kind of transitions nicely into the second part of the talk, the different ways that these two maps displayed particular deference to specifically Spanish authorities. So beginning with Guam and Poma, remember his entire Nueva Coronica is not just a chronicle, a history of Peruvian mass genocide and the disruption of political authority. It's also a direct letter to King Philip III. It is subversive in that way. And here at the very beginning of his treatise, he includes a dedication to King Philip III. Another way that he maybe acknowledges authority is the use of the Spanish language itself. Patricia Seed, who works on Latin American maps in the early modern, 
gives a fantastic take of this when she writes that throughout the conquest, language became an instrument of domination, a means of coercing speakers of indigenous languages in order to mold their minds, expressions, and thoughts. And I think that we can consider Guam and Poma using, using Spanish when he was a native speaker of Quechua as a way of making himself the alien in this dialogue of ensuring that he is showing deference, that he is coming to the European side just to make his claim, as opposed to expecting the Europeans to come to his side. He also includes these central blazons that I mentioned earlier. So you might see that the papacy here and the Spanish empire represented by their coats of arms are situated right where Cusco should be, right where the political, authorial, cultural center of Guam and Poma's world should be. In terms of Urbano Monti, we also see some flattering scenes directed to, Span to the Spanish authority. So for example, here are some really interesting images of Spanish armadas um, situated in the Atlantic. Uh, to be fair though, there are countless other depictions of other cultures, navies. So for example, we have the Navy of Prester John Pretiani, as well as the Navy of the Grand Turk. We also have the Navy of the Persians represented by Sophie, I believe is a translation of Sufi as well as that of China. But I'd like to make the claim that he specifically foregrounds the imperial authority of the Spanish and disproportionately so. He doesn't just show the Spanish imperial navy in the Atlantic, he also does that in the Pacific. He also does that uh, near the Moluccas where the Spanish combined with the Portuguese empire at this time had some control over the Spice Islands. He also includes some interesting historical details. So here he specifically recounts the first circumnavigation of the globe pioneered by Ferdinand Magellan, but uh, Magellan didn't make it all the way uh, to the other side of the globe. Instead, the trip was finished by the Venetian explorer and slave trader, Antonio Pigafetta. Um, and what's really interesting about this as well is that even though he had finished the first edits or the first composition of this 1587 map that year in 1587, it seems like he's crossed out some of his writing and also made sure that he includes the specific year that the circumnavigation was completed, the annual 1522. This isn't the only time when he demonstrates obeisance to the Spanish authority. I think the most clear example on this map is this specific cartouche in the Atlantic where we see the Spanish king leaning over and lending an ear to a Peruvian king who kneels down and points over to the side, points over specifically to the west where Peru is located, as though he's guiding the Spanish king to conquer his own land. If we zoom in a bit more, you'll actually notice that there are some really subtle details in terms of the depiction of globes. The Peruvian king has his hand grasping a globe with the toponym Peru situated over it. It's as though Guaman, it's as though, excuse me, Urbano Monti is making the case that the Peruvian king has specific dominion over Peru. But if we look to King Philip II, he doesn't have a globe with a toponym over it. It's as though King Philip II isn't constrained by toponym, as though his empire is universal, as though it's expanding, as though it's on the verge of complete domination. And I also think that this is a really interesting moment in comparing the lives between Guam and Poma and Urbano Monti. It's almost kind of like a historical glitch in the matrix where Urbano Monti, to show deference to a Spanish authority, depicts another individual, specifically a Peruvian colonial subject, demonstrating his own obeisance. It's kind of multiple layers of deference stacked one upon the other. Now, I feel like the ultimate question to ask for this section is why in the world were they being deferential? Specifically Urbano Monti, he didn't design his piece for King Philip II, so why is he being so deferential to King Philip II? I feel like the first answer is that he's simply trying to establish credibility as a subject of the Spanish crown. Remember Milan had been taken over in 1536 by the Spanish. Now, the thing about this is that we can maybe consider it as a kind of game of propriety. Throughout the early modern, we see individuals who engage in humanistic discourse as showing deference to the particular lords that they're subjects of. So this is really nothing new. It's just a way of kind of cloaking ones or shrouding ones discourse and making sure that you follow the rules of the game, the rules of propriety of decorum. The second reason that I'd like to argue that I think is really important for understanding comparing Guam and Poma's self-portraiture with Urbano Monti's is that they show this deference because they wanna couch very personal claims in a palatable language, in a language that didn't just show propriety, but also made it easier for them to be what I would now consider a little bit egotistical, a little bit unhumble and prideful. This leads us to the final part of the talk. And the important claim that I wanna make here is that they portray themselves to make very personal claims about some subject. They wanna claim ownership over something in particular, but what they claim 
differs. For Guaman Poma, I'd argue that he is making a territorial claim that the depiction of his grandfather and his grandmother on this map, as well as the depiction of his emblem, blazon, or coat of arms, is directly a territorial claim for a parcel of land. Urbano Monti, on the other hand, I would argue, is not making that sort of claim. He's making a claim perhaps to an epistemology, to a way of thinking about the world. He wasn't so much concerned with, let's say, expansion territorially. Like I mentioned earlier, he didn't really occupy many civic positions and didn't really have uh, the best status as an administrator of the city of Milan. I don't think that was his ambition. Instead, he had the ambition of becoming the intellectual chaperone of an emerging world, an emergingly, an, a world that was becoming increasingly interconnected and was oftentimes undergirded by a spirit of universalism. In order to claim that, in order to kind of back up these claims, I want to go through the different ways that they portray themselves in their masterpieces. So for Urbano Monti, like I mentioned already, and I've been using these icons throughout the presentation, he depicts himself in the map directly. Guaman Poma does not. The image that you see at right isn't actually an image on the map. It's a later image in the Nueva Coronica where um, specifically Guaman Poma titles this as the author inquires of his people. I'd argue that this is basically Guaman Poma establishing some authorial ethos, establishing credibility as an eyewitness of the trauma of indigenous people in order to assert a claim that the Spanish empire doesn't have a right to control them. They also express themselves via genealogy. So for example, Urbano Monti worked on a genealogical tree that featured himself, his fathers and his sons showcasing a shared noble Milanese lineage. Guaman Poma does something I think a little bit more interesting here. In the very beginning of his Nueva Coronica, he writes a letter to the king from the perspective of his own father. It's a stab at making sure that King Philip III knows that Guaman Poma isn't making up any of these claims about noble heritage, that he in fact has an authentic real claim to being a descendant of the Incan royal line. Lastly, I'd like to talk about these coats of arms. If we look to the left, Urbano Monti's coat of arms isn't really imposed upon Milan. It's not like he's doing the same thing as Guam and Poma, where he situates his face or his coat of arms or his, family noble, his family's noble lineage on the city of Milan itself. Instead, he situates his coat of arms to the very fringes of the map. This, of course, contrasts what Guam and Poma is doing, where instead of the coat of arms being on the fringes of the map, it is directly on the map. And I think this means that there are different ties to terrestrial space between them. I think here, Urbano Monti is making the case that he specifically doesn't lay claim to any territory, but rather he's laying claim to being the author of this map. He's emphasizing and foregrounding that level of authorship. Whereas Guaman Poma, on the other hand, is doing something different. He is imposing his genealogy as well as, as his coat of arms on the land itself. And so to summarize really quickly, I think that we can think of Guaman Poma's map as envisioning a world partially possessed by his own lineage but still completely under the dominion of Europeans. Remember that the papacy in the Spanish empire are at the very center of this map where Cusco should be. Conversely, I think, oh, excuse me. Conversely, I think that we can think of Urbano Monti's map as envisioning a world possessed by the Spanish, but mediated by Monti. Monti is now the intellectual chaperone of the emerging world order. Ultimately, I think that we can conclude that Monti presents us an example of self-portraiture that is balanced with a level of deference, that the only way for him to make the claim that he should be the intellectual chaperone of the Spanish empire is by acknowledging the authority of King Philip II. Similarly, I think we can think of Guaman Poma as presenting an example of self-portraiture and specifically asserting a claim over territory, but he can only do that by essentially cloaking that in deference to the authority of the papacy and the authority of the Spanish empire. Even though he subverts Spanish authority, he has to do it in a way that acknowledges their higher dominion. And so we might end this presentation by saying, Monty and Poma achieve bold, utopic self-representations insofar as they can encode their work in a language of deference. And we might end it right there, but I don't think that's the whole thing. I'm sorry. Uh, Salim, I see you coming in and out, but this is not the real conclusion. Um, there is a little bit more. I think that the conclusion here maybe essentializes too much. It claims that I think that Monty and Poma are doing very similar things with their self-portraiture, but I think we can really only understand what Guam and Poma specifically is doing by understanding the exigencies of his colonial context. And one way that he's being particularly subversive against both the 
against the Spanish empire in particular is by Andean spatial symbolism. This is something that Relena Adorno drives home towards the end of her monograph. And I am now borrowing uh, to basically explain what's so deeply subversive about Poma. It's this sort of dichotomy between what she calls the Hanan and the Huron, which the Hanan being usually located in the upper parts of illustrations or spaces, um, which would, as well as the conceptual right, which for us would be the same as stage left. Um, the Huron, on the other hand, is in the lower parts of illustrations and is in the conceptual left or, um, excuse me, conceptual left would be the same as stage left, viewers right, conceptual right would be the same thing as stage right, viewers left. Sorry, bit of a mix up. Um, and the difference between them is that Hanan usually invokes some level of masculinity, some level of superiority. Huron, on the other hand, invokes a level of femininity, inferiority. And I think that we can really understand how this comes into play if we look at something that I failed to mention at the beginning of this presentation. I talked about the graticule, about these horizontal and vertical lines, but I kind of missed these lines right here. I also just noticed that it kind of looks like the English flag, that wasn't my intention, but I didn't talk about these diagonal lines. What exactly do they mean? Well, if we impose the dichotomy of Hanan and Huron on, on these diagonal lines in the different quarters that they carve up across the map, we'll see that uh, all the way to the left is the superior position, all the way to the right is the second position, um, we can also see this sort of dichotomy manifest in the top and the bottom. So Antisuyu is Hanan, uh, Kuntisu is Huron. All of these names, by the way, uh, refer specifically to Andean, uh, Andean labels for the division of Tawant and Suyu, which is the Incan realm. And just to reiterate, the order of hierarchy that this uh, insinuates is where the center comes in first, Chinshai Suyu comes second, and then it goes to the right, the top, and the bottom. So let's come back to this map and let's focus in particular on two different spatial relationships, that of Guam and Poma's grandparents that I've been referring to throughout this entire presentation, as well as the spatial relationship between the papacy and the Spanish empire. As you may have already guessed, Poma imposes his own ancestry in the second position. This is the second most important place on the map. He's not just staking a claim for any one territory. He's also staking a claim for a particular position on an ordered hierarchy. If we look at the, the blazons of the papacy in the Spanish empire, we will see that the papacy is in the Hanan position, whereas the Spanish empire is in the Huron position. So just as Guam and Poma emphasizes his own authority through the dichotomy of Hanan and Huron, he also de-emphasizes the authority of the, Spain, the Spanish relative to the papacy. And this is actually repeated throughout the Nueva Coronica. For example, when I talked about the letter to the king that he introduces as a form of deference to King Philip III, I failed to mention that he, before he even includes that letter to the king, he puts in a letter to the pope. This also shows up on the title page of the work itself, where the pope, outlined in blue and depicted at top left, looks down upon the Spanish king in the Huron position, in the inferior position at bottom right. And the sort of argument that Guaman Poma is making subversively, visually, is that the Spanish doesn't just, the Spanish don't just have to answer to the indigenous populations of Peru directly for all of their mass devastation of, uh, during the colonial enterprise, but they have to respond directly to the calls of a higher spiritual authority. They have to respond to the papacy. This is an argument that also is made by people like Bartolome de las Casas around the same exact time. Las Casas was a Spanish priest and one of the earliest advocates from Europe for indigenous rights. He writes in his short account of the destruction of the Indies, I do not wish to see my country destroyed as a divine punishment for sins against the honor of God and the true faith. In a similar way, we see Guam and Poma marshal the authority of the papacy to undermine that of the Spanish empire. And I also think that this is exactly where we see Guam and Poma's complex political outlook actualized. Like Relena Adorno said, and I mentioned at the very beginning of this presentation, Guam and Poma was in favor of native rule and opposed to colonialism. He was anti-clerical, but pro-Catholic. He adopted some forms of European discourse in order to undermine, to stake a claim, to advance his own interests rhetorically, politically. And I think that this also constitutes something for self-portraiture. I think that Guam and Poma is undergoing something like a paradoxical subversion, where in order to subvert Spanish hegemony on his Mapamundi, Guam and Poma both uh, undermines himself and the crown to the superordinate authority of the papacy. He challenges the authority of the Spanish empire as a devout servant of the Catholic church, not only as an indigenous man. 
This doesn't mean that he's being inauthentic though. I still think he's communicating an authentic indig indigenous self, just it's not completely divorced from European discourse. It's selectively and politically enmeshed within it. Um, and the question that you might be asking is, can we extend this paradoxical subversion to Urbano Monti? Well, the naive freshman Armand surely thought he could when he wrote, just as Guam and Poma presents an overtly Christianized self in the subversion of imperial authority, Urbano Monti and his defiance of European symbolic traditions of ownership presents an originator self that depends on the products of Iberian globalization. And here is Urbano Monti and Guaman Poma peering down what I wrote and being very, very furious with it. Um, and the reason why I think this is a bad, bad argument and the reason why I, I've come to revise this argument is because I, I don't think that we can compare these examples of self-portraiture in this sort of paradoxical subversion because Urbano Monti isn't being politically subversive, at least ostensibly. We might need more archival details to back something like this up. I think the question that I failed to ask when I originally wrote this essay was, how subversive was Monty really trying to be? I think that he was just kind of interested in his own program of universal knowledge. He was interested in asserting a place as an intellectual chaperone, but not for claiming land. And I think that this makes all the difference. Another way of thinking about this is that Urbano Monty uses acts of difference to legitimate his didactic works, whereas Guam and Poma uses those acts of difference to legitimate his works as well as to subvert political authority. So there's kind of a bit more of a nuance when we consider the self-portraiture of Guam and Poma. I would also like to note that there's a very famous quote from Audre Lorde that I think goes on the lines of, for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And okay, this is gonna be completely out of context, but I think Guam and Poma shows us here that there really is no other way to dismantle the master's house that in his particular case, he has to take some of their tools in order to begin the work of disestablishing. So unfortunately they aren't literary foils as much as I wanted them to be. Um, they aren't Frankenstein and his monster. And that's a bit unfortunate, but I think more important than finding perfect likeness between these sources, we found something kind of like near likeness. And maybe that's a bit more mature. Maybe that's a bit less naive. I'm gonna go back to our, the conclusions now and modify them. Monty is exactly where we left him. He uses self-portraiture in a way where he balances it with acts of deference in order to legitimate his work, in order to play a game of propriety, where he basically corroborates his work and, and works in an existing discourse with other humanistic pieces that show deference to Spanish authority. It's just kind of a way of encoding one's work with the language that's popular at the time. I think Guaman Poma, on the other hand, is doing that and also in the act of doing that, transforming himself, that the very act of self-portraiture on European terms requires a sort of transformation of what is what defines authentic indig indigeneity. So to revise the big takeaway of this presentation, the one thing that I hope that you maybe take away from this, if nothing else, is that these two really weird amateur cartographers use world maps to negotiate a place in an ever globalizing world, but to very different effects on the self. And even though they aren't literary foils, I think that we can still rest happy with the poetic reality that these are very personal reflections of the, uni of the universe. Thank you, that is the talk. Armand, thank you so very much for a fascinating talk here. Uh, there's just, uh, I think, you know, with the map, uh, when we first, uh, I was speaking of Armando Monti's map, uh, particularly, uh, when it came to the center after David acquired it, uh, we thought there were several dissertations that would come out of it. There's so much to unpack and uh, you've done a marvelous job uh, of, of uh, connecting these two um, uh, manuscript works. Um, uh, again, uh, uh, I want to um, thank you and again, congratulate you on behalf of uh, the Society, California Map Society and the Center for um, writing a great essay, doing a great talk and, um, and a winning, winning competition. Um, we, uh, we, are, so we have a few questions coming in um, and I will start, uh, uh, we'll start with, the, with, with the very first one. Um, so uh, uh, if you want, to, you could, you could um, maybe unshare the screen okay. if you like and then go back. Uh, that way um, you can answer, but if you can refer. So this, uh, this question is from uh, Jerry uh, Rosenthal and he asks, uh, 
Does Guamo and Pomo's map contain evidence of knowledge of Asia and the Pacific gained from the extensive Spanish trade between Peru and the Philippines in the latter part of the 16th century? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, from what I understand, chances are he probably did. It would be really surprising if he didn't have any conception of Spanish trade networks. That being said, his map of Mundi, I think, isn't so much about depicting accurate space. And so we certainly don't see Asia on this map, um, or we might actually, but it's certainly not in a typical depiction. Uh, but that is a really good question. I think that, like I said earlier, I'd be really surprised if he had no idea of that. There were definitely tons of connections between uh, the emerging colonial order in Peru, but then also in colonial New Spain, what is now Mexico, um, between that area and then also Asia. Um, in the 17th century, there would be uh, a, um, a sort of like regulated, consistent silver trade. Yeah, at least right. that's the top of my knowledge, but I, I think there might be more that I don't, uh, there's certainly more that I don't know, yeah. Great, um, the, the next question is uh, from uh, John Dablonski and uh, um, hi, John. He asks, uh, are both of these uh, manuscripts if not printed? Um, that's the first question. Um, the second part is uh, the idea of the cartographer slash author slash scribe uh, inserting themselves more and more as modernity takes hold feels familiar to me. And, uh, uh, and, and the timeline, the 1500s seem to match. Uh, but this is the first time I've heard of an indigenous, indigenous American author. Are there other early indigenous authors that we should know about? Uh, yes. And in fact, two weeks from now, on November 6th, there will be another event hosted by the David Rumsey Map Center that features the work of a fantastic scholar who's written extensively about native depictions of land and their use of those depictions to kind of assert land rights. I believe it's in New Spain. Um, so yes, uh, uh, yes, are... that's on a roll, and I will, I will, uh, uh, when we are all done, I will uh, let people know about it. So it's great. I'm glad there's that connection. Yeah, I, I, I'm actually. I don't think I'll be able to make it, but I'm really sad because it looks really fascinating. I send you the recording. <laughs> lots of connections. Um, in terms of, sorry, the first part of this question was. Oh, uh, first was, uh, are they both manuscript maps and not printed? Yes, yes, they're both manuscripts. But Guaman Poma had intended for his to be printed. Um, and that's why he's opted to use uh, very specific types of, of uh, script. Like he's basically written his script so that it could be sent to a printer or a stationer, and then they would develop uh, um, a, a printed map from that. Uh, Urbano Monti, I believe the same, although I think he has a printed version of his map. That, might, that may be the 1615 one, but I'm, I'm not actually so sure. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, this is from Karen Megan uh, to you. Um, so, uh, can you say more about how this, this project resulted in a transformation of the self for Guam and Pomo? Yeah, definitely. Um, hi, Professor Wigan. It's, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I think that, yeah, that's basically the crux of my essay, and it's certainly something that I had argued. I think it's like the main thrust. And the sort of argument that I'm using here, what I'm basing it off of, really, is that Guam and Poma has a sort of political mindset when approaching this. He has a political strategy in mind in order to subvert the authority of the Spanish. Um, and the only way to kind of subvert the Spanish is to fully adopt the discourse that they have when it comes to spiritualism, when it comes to religion, to souls, to the Catholic church. Um, so what I think this kind of shows is a transformation, maybe not of Guam and Poma specifically, but what we think of as an indigenous authentic self. I think what it really shows is a transformation of indigenous selves, not as being completely rooted in quote unquote pure, which is completely anachronistic and a bit rude, um, but rather kind of negotiating their identity using the discourses provided them by Europeans. So what I really think, I, I think maybe there's, okay, I could go on for maybe hours about this because I think it, it definitely raises a lot of questions, but when I mean transformation, I don't know if I necessarily mean the transformation of Guam and Poma as an individual. I think that he thought he was Catholic through and through. I don't think that he thought he was going through a significant transformation. But I do think that if we look at the big span of 16th century contributions of indigenous authors, um, this would kind of result in a transformation of what was considered authentically indigenous. But yeah, that's a great question. And it's very much, I think, the heart of what I write about. Thank you, Armand. Um, other questions for Armand? Um, you, you could... Uh, 
you can use the QA box uh, or even uh, use the chat. Um, we're a smaller group today, but uh, uh, they're missing a, they missed a fantastic talk. So um, anyway, uh, yes, any, any other questions as we... One thing that I just wanted to notice is that I have reflected quite a bit about some of like the arguments that I end up making in this essay. And uh, I just realized that I feel like I am currently embodying Guam and Poma because I'm very deferential at top, but like I mentioned, I'm, I'm wearing pajama bottoms on bottom. I, I, I'm being kind of subversive on bottom, but deferential at top, so. <laughs> great, great. Um, all right, so um, I, uh, I, again, uh, Arman, um, uh, I want to thank you again uh, for, for, for the talk. And um, what I want to uh, uh, quickly uh, say is that uh, all the folks uh, who have attended uh, will get a, a recording of the talk and um, we'll have it up on the website and, uh, uh, and so forth. So I, I want to quickly uh, towards uh, just, just end here, give, give you a sense of what's coming. Uh, at the center, in not just um, uh, the next talk, but uh, uh, beyond that, and and also the next year, I just kind of allude to that. And um, yeah, so I'll, I'm just going to share uh, my our next newsletter over here, um, and um, and then um, yeah, let me see if. Uh, Can you see that, Armand? So, um, yeah, that's great. Um, so, uh, what's coming um, is uh, for in um, uh, November. We have a couple of talks uh, co coming up this year. Um, this is uh, what Armand mentioned. We have a talk from Ana Polido Rul. Uh, she is uh, she is from the University of Arkansas, and she has written. Um, this book about mapping religious land, um, and, you know, essentially what is now, you know, Mexico and for the South. So um, uh, we, this is a, um, um, we are uh, co-sponsoring this uh, with the Center on Latin American Studies, uh, also um, the um, Native American Cultural Center uh, is also co-sponsoring it. And, um, it's really kind of a teaser in a way for what's coming down next year. And that is, um, we're, we're moving towards slowly but surely towards the next Ruderman Conference, the Barry Lawrence Ruderman Conference that will happen uh, in October of uh, 21, uh, which at this point, you know, I mean, it looks like it's gonna be online, but you, you never know. Um, uh, but uh, there's also an, an amazing event, uh, sort of year long thing that's uh, not an event, but you know, the commemoration, however you want to call it. Um, uh, next year is actually the, the 500th anniversary of the fall of the Aztec Empire. And so um, there's just a lot of things just sort of converging. Um, and so this is one of the, um, one of those, um, um, one of those years uh, that are, that's coming about. Um, in, uh, in, um, in, in December, we have uh, Nick Canis. He's an active member of the California Map Society and uh, uh, sort of an expert in all things uh, celestial, written several books. He's going to talk about uh, mapping the heavens, celestial cartography from ancient to modern times. Uh, so uh, looking forward to that. Um, and um, I think... Um, yeah, those are those are things that are coming down the pike. Uh, just um, as always, um, um, I'm just going to stop the share here. So as always, um, uh, please. Um, um, I think uh, Rayon is going to uh, put in in the chat page uh, how to register for our talks um, and the upcoming talks, and then um, you know our newsletter uh, is uh, the best way to. Uh, keep informed about what what we are about what what's going on, and um, you can simply also send us an email Ramsey Map Center at Stanford.edu. So, um, thank you again, um, all of you for company uh, coming, and of course Arman, and uh, again uh, as a you know, um, uh, I know there were a lot of California Map Society members that attended. I'm so uh, glad that they're they're able to do so. Um, I'm just gonna see uh, there's. Thank you.
other, um, let's see, up the events, um, the Ryan has put a talk up as the Nick Hannes talk. So I think we're all, we're all good. All right, uh, everyone. Um, thanks again and have a wonderful weekend. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.